We all, well, many of us, uh, have already heard Faisal Saeed al-Mutar speaking yesterday on the panel talking about international atheism. And um, that was a great panel. A lot of good ideas brought forth. Uh, some we agree with, some we didn't agree with, but the need for understanding and discussion continues. Um, Faisal, come on up, please. Um, this, this wonderful gentleman, my neighbor, he lives in Washington, D.C. as well, and um, the route he took to getting there is uh, one that is truly a mission and a labor. So, Faisal, thank you so much. May I? Okay, here we go. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Is everyone having a good time? Actually, I feel awkward for speaking on Saturday afternoon. I feel like I'm a priest or a member of the clergy. Uh, in Islam, they do have a afternoon prayer, so I think let's continue the preaching. Uh, actually, yesterday, uh, I got a revelation that I should change my speech uh, and use my time more efficiently to speak more about my vision uh, other than my background. But I can give you a hint about my background. I think everybody can notice over here that I do have a weird accent, and I'm not an American, uh, but was born in a country that you are probably familiar with. Uh, America has invaded just a decade ago, uh, called Iraq. Um, I arrived in the United States last year, actually, as a refugee for multiple reasons. I, I still remember when I did my interview, and he said, well, five reasons are enough. Five reasons are enough. So you can get an idea of what the danger I was facing. But the main one was as a result of because my eldest brother, my cousin, and my best friend were all killed by Al-Qaeda in Baghdad, in northern Baghdad, in the result of the Civil War 2007. Actually, the American Atheist Convention was the first atheist convention I've been into in my life. That was in Austin last year. And I think I have a family over here. So thank you all. And I would like to thank um, Dave Silverman and Dave Moscato and all the AA staff for putting this convention together. Oh, wow. I'm using the digital stuff. Well, so uh, the main reason why I became an activist myself is I don't want to live in the same world that I grew up in. For me personally, especially now, coming out as a non-believer is an ethical duty. Uh, and it's an act of solidarity for those who cannot come out as atheists and non-believers because they may get killed, killed for it. The more non-believers come out of a closet, the more will be taken seriously nationally and internationally. I've been involved in secular activism since a very young age. I have suffered a lot of it. And at the same time, enjoyed and continue enjoying doing it. Because my passion is centered about change, a positive one. I'm a result-driven person not simply intention-driven one. Intentions don't matter in the physical world, results do. The reason why I advocate for secularism is because it's, not, it's the only proven way to ensure religious freedom, freedom of religion, and freedom from religion. I believe in a secular world where there is separate, an absolute separation between mosque and state and church and state. A religion-neutral government in which people are openly free to express their beliefs or lack thereof. And it should not be a crime to be an atheist. It's a right. <laughs> Blasphemy laws should not exist in the 21st century. They belong in the trash cans where they belong, when they belong. And cartoonists should not have their life threatened for making a cartoon about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. <laughs> and media companies should not be afraid of being blown up for publishing these cartoons because of a threat made of one religion in particular. Free thinkers and non-believers face death in 13 countries around the world in a study published by the Washington Post. Afghanistan, Iran, some parts of Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritania, Nigeria, Pakistan, surprise, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, which recently declared atheists as terrorists, irony, 
Somalia, Sudan, United Arab Emirates, and Yemen. That's acceptable. It's time to put a stop for that rubbish. It also needs to be mentioned that there is a common feature in all these countries. All of them are Islamic theocracies. But I could be one of these delusional people who think that there is no compulsion religion in Islam as a religion of peace. Which brings me to the second segment of my speech. If you look at religion globally, it's very unfair and dishonest, in my opinion, to say that all religion extremists, religious extremists are equally dangerous at this moment. And I made that clear in the panel yesterday. In the 21st century, as we speak, there are religions and set of beliefs, if taken literally, are more dangerous than others. The belief that says humanists, atheists, LGBT people should be killed is much more dangerous, in my opinion, that, than atheists cannot hold public office or gays cannot be, get married. Even though both beliefs are ridiculous, but they're not equally harmful. While we are now in the state of Utah, which is actually I love Utah, it's a pretty good state, I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with the play called The Book of Mormon. It's a satirical play making fun of Mormonism. But I want to ask those people who think that all religious extremists are equal, equally dangerous, to make similar plays about different religions. And I would like to know what embassies are going to be burned as a result of that, and what is the religion of the people who are burning these embassies? And if your answer that they all react the same way, then you probably live in an alternative universe. And you deserve a Nobel Prize for proving that the multiverse theory is correct. <laughs> and I think, you, I think you know what I'm getting into. But the in the 21st century, I keep to remind people that we live now in 2014, not in the 15th or the 16th century, and that fundamentalist Islam is the most dangerous of all fundamentalism. What a racist and Islamophobic thing to say. I also like to remind these people that fundamentalist Islam and Islamism are not a race. It's an ideology. And all ideologies should not be immune from a criticism or debate. <laughs> Humans have rights. Cultures, ideologies, and beliefs don't. Let's look at... Thank you. Let's let, take a look at the new laws passed in the Iraqi parliament called Jaffari laws, which are part of Sharia law. I'm going to take a, give you a summary about this. Article 16 of that bill set the legal age of marriage into nine for females and males into 15, although this can be lowered into one or two if the guardian, quote unquote, choose that the daughter can be buried by that age and choose their husband for her. Article 104 permits unconditional polygamy. Mormons may like that. Uh, Article 101 says that men have the right to enjoy sex with their wives anytime they want, and wives cannot, there, cannot leave their home without their husband's permission. Article 126 says husbands are not required to pay financial support when their wife is either a minor or a senior and hence unable to sexually satisfy them. And that's in the law right now. Article 63 prevents Muslim males permanently from marrying non-Muslim females, which means Shia Muslim male is allowed to marry non-Muslim females only temporarily, which is called the mut'a marriage. So the mut'a marriage is simply like a contract you make, and I say I want to get married for two hours, or one year, or two years, and the person who supervised that is a religious figure. For the lack of better word, I think he's just a pimp. <laughs> uh, I've had an unpleasant conversation, actually, with a person who has a PhD in anthropology in a university in Northern California. I don't like to mention this university because I don't want to get in trouble. I was talking to her about honor killing, which is something extremely common in Muslim-dominated countries, which in my opinion needs to stop, and I see no honor in killing. And that's her response. She said, that's, I'm quoting her, she said if a woman was born and raised in America and she was raped or murdered, that's a crime because that's our culture. But if she was born in a Muslim-dominated country and she got killed or raped 
and the culture is okay with that, we should respect and tolerate that. That's what she said. I wanted to ask her first what type of a drug she's using and what is the color in her sky. But I was shocked in a way that I couldn't say anything. The sad thing about that is that, that is the, she is not the only one who holds these views. And I came across a lot of similar views as I travel around the United States in venues and universities. And that's the thing about, that's the thing called moral relativism, if you're familiar with it, moral cultural relativism. But the thing about moral relativism is it's self-refuting. Saying that moral, morality is relative and, uh, and, and rape is a crime in some country while in other country it's not, is itself an objective moral statement. Uh, women are human beings and they should be treated as such. No woman in the world No woman in this world deserves to be raped and murdered in the name of honor. Women rights are human rights. That's not negotiable. And human rights should triumph religious and cultural rights. She also say, she said to me that saying that honor killing and rape in different country is wrong is a form of imperialism. Irony. Moral relativism and cultural relativism, relativism sorry, English is my second language, uh, are a new form of cancer that is spreading around the world, especially in academia, and those who have a dose of common sense should unite together to find a cure. Back to the Islamic pho phobia topic again. Why is it so difficult for people to understand that criticizing an ideology is different, is it not equivalent to hatred of people who hold this? Why religion, and especially the religion of peace, and I'm using this term ironically, is being sheltered from any form of intellectual debate or criticism? Is the criticizing the platform of the Republican or Democratic Party is equivalent to hating people who hold Democratic Republican values? Why would somebody, anybody criticize Islam say, oh, why do you hate Muslims? Is it crit or it's racist to criticize Muslims or Islam. Is criticizing capitalism racist? Is it criticizing socialism racist? Why is this double standard? I don't know why many people freak out when suddenly someone says something critical of Islam. Why liberals, some liberals in this country, get so angry when a social conservative Republican want to pass a bill to ban gay marriage, but when Muslim countries pass laws that execute gays, they simply turn a blind eye and say we should respect their culture. The double standard has to stop, in my opinion. And those who advocate for liberal values here in America and the Western world must stand in, the, in solidarity with their allies in Baghdad, Tehran, and Beirut, and all across the Muslim world. <laughs> Let's look at it this way. Nobody had the chance to decide where they were born. And just the sheer and bad luck that you were born in a country that excuses you for being who you are and who you love shouldn't mean that you don't have your basic human rights. No matter what's your sex, gender, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, orientation, no matter where you are born, you deserve your basic human rights. Human rights should not be negotiable, but religion and ideologies should be negotiable. I, I also would like to mention that a criticism of Islam or any ideology is not equivalent to a criticism of all Muslims. There are many moderate, nice, loving Muslims who are moderates out there, and you know, I was raised by some of them. And we should support moderate Muslims against those who are extremists. But to deny that there is an, a link between Islamic extremism and terrorism is dangerous and delusional, and denial comes with consequences. President Barack Obama, I don't know if you have heard about him, he's a secret Muslim from Kenya. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, he was asked, what country that keeps you awake at night? He answered, Pakistan. And I think you all know the answer why. There is a late, late reason, ladies and gentlemen, why Osama bin Laden was found in Pakistan, not in Sweden. <coughs> Pakistan is a failed state with the nuclear weapons, filled with Islamic extremists, mostly funded by Saudi Arabia, quote unquote, our ally. The government hardly is able to control anything, and the ISI who created and supported the Taliban in order to occupy Afghanistan during the Cold War are still allies with them. The Taliban, the same guys who throw acid at women for going to school, 
and the same guys who shot Malala Yousafzai. I want to imagine, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, fellow heathens, if these people who hold the same ideology who did 9-11 have access to nuclear bombs on chemical weapons, what a different world we would be living in at the moment. These, these people had no problem with murdering 3,000 people. I don't think they would mind killing 300 million people in the name of their poisonous ideology. In Iraq, we have 9-11 every month, if not every week. And it also needs to be mentioned that the most victims of Muslim Islamic extremism are actually moderate Muslims because Islamic extremists kill those who don't consider are true Muslims. Even though I don't agree with this term because being a true Muslim is like being a true astrologer. It's all based upon superstition. So you cannot really be a true Muslim. But they still get killed for simply not following the fundamentalists, what the fundamentalists believe in. And now I want to get into the solution. I hope I have time for that. Uh, Secularists and those who hold humanistic values from all over the world must unite, must unite and be organized to combat this form of extremism and all forms of extremism and replace them with better systems of living, mostly focused, if not only focused, on this life, not in mythical heaven or hell. I'm often asked the question, why do you think it needs to change about US foreign policy towards the Middle East or the Muslim world? I think it's a fair question. And I think that a lot of stuff needs to be changed about it. But I also, I think it's equally important, if not more important, is that we have to ask the question, what should the Muslim world do? Because peace is a two-way street. And you cannot, you cannot have peace with people who want to behead you. That's, uh, so, mm, what, there are a lot of, I need to talk actually, I just remember that. Uh, and there's also, and actually need to back to the liberal idea, when they talk about cultural relativism, I, I always refer to it as racism of lower expectations. That you expect less of them than you expect of yourself. Shouldn't Islam go through a reformation and catch up with the Enlightenment just like most religions do? Throughout my years of activism, secular activism, I have made alliances with as many secular organizations as possible. And I would like to ma make more across the world because I truly think that secularism and humanism are the answer. I truly wish and want secular humanist groups to find a common ground so we can all work together other than find between each other over different of approaches. I think it's healthy to have different approaches, but most importantly, we must be united and find a common ground, at least on these major issues and important issues and call a spade a spade. That's my main vision of my work and my activism, is to create an umbrella group, Global Secular Humanist Movement, with an umbrella group to unite all secular organizations and to create a world inspired by humanist ethics, compassion, and guided by knowledge and reason. Not morality based upon fear and authoritarianism. I work in another work project that I'm involved in. It's called Global Secular Organizing and Strategy, which is, I work with an awesome team. We try to organize secularists for the Iowa caucus for 2016 elections. We have Professor Daniel Dennett in our advisory board, and Richard Dawkins sport, spoke at our event, actually, last week in Iowa. Richard Dawkins, peace be upon him. Uh, <laughs> and I, th I think we, have all, we all need to find a common ground, no matter where we belong and where we are born. I was actually asked a question just a few days ago. They said, like, what's like being a free thinker or a secularist in Iraq or the Middle East? My answer is always, it's, it's like feeling like being the only sober person in a cult full with the drunk people and you're not allowed to drive. <laughs> Thank you. I, th I think the case can be made in many places around the world. I think now is the time to get our driving license and drive. I think it's the time to move on from just simply building community but rather work together to make a positive change in public policy and foreign policy, not only here in America, but all across the world. Anne Hirsi Ali, as you, is actually, I, I wanted to mention her more in my speech. She got a recent case in this Islamophobia thing, and she said uh, intolerance of intolerance is cowardice, and I think so too. And I think we should stop being so apologetic. 
I think that the solutions, fa uh, problems facing the Middle East have to be solved within first the people from within in that part of the world before they can be solved from the United States or the West. And those who want to make a positive change in that part of the world need to be supported, whether through nonprofits, NGOs, or through their elected officials. Thank you. Now I all ask you to think of this. I, I want each one of you to think, what can I contribute to make a secular world? All of us work together with our experience and expertise. We can make this happen. And I truly believe in, in that. And I'm dedicating my life for this project. I want to thank American Atheists for inviting me. I want to thank everybody for attending my speech. May science and reason bless you, and may science and reason bless the United States of America. Thank you so much.